Okay, this is a uh, lecture history 1302, uh, and we are going to look at today what is uh, known as Congressional Reconstruction uh, and uh, the continuing uh, reunification of the United States in the aftermath of the Civil War. And we pick up our story today with the impeachment and trial uh, of Andrew Johnson. Now, Andrew Johnson, as I've said previously to you, was the wrong man in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, if Lincoln uh, was the man for the crisis, the man for the moment who saved the Union and freed the slaves, Andrew Johnson probably was almost exactly the opposite and should never have been anywhere close to power uh, in the uh, United States, uh, especially in the, uh, such an office as the presidency in such a perilous time. Well, anyways, Andrew Johnson uh, oftentimes misplayed his hands, uh, misplayed his po uh, political situation, misunderstood his enemies, uh, infuriated folks, and so forth. And on top of that, Andrew Johnson had real enemies who were also quite cunning and uh, came to despise him. So Johnson uh, was part of his own worst enemy at times, and also he had enemies, uh, and that will help bring him down. Johnson in 1867 is going to run afoul, uh, in 1868 also, is going to run afoul of the Congressional Republicans. Uh, by 1867 and 1868, the Congressional Republicans are dominated uh, by the Radical Republicans, and the Radical Republicans have their own version and vision for the way they want the nation reunited. In 1867 and 68, Johnson on multiple occasions, and actually going back in 1866, will veto multiple pieces of legislation designed to help the freedmen out and also designed to curtail Johnson's own presidential powers. In 1866, some of the things that uh, infuriated uh, elect the electorate and also radical Republicans in general, Republicans and radical Republicans in the Congress, was Johnson uh, vetoes what's known as the Freedmen's Bureau Bill. That bureau, the Freedmen's Bureau, was designed to help the recently freed slaves in their uh, transition from slavery and bondage into something uh, like uh, citizenship uh, and freedom. That was a federal government program, but because Andrew Johnson was a uh, Union Democrat, and more particularly an Andrew Jackson-type Democrat, he believed that was, uh, the th that was best left to the states to let them do that job. Problem is, as I've said before, the southern states where most of your freedmen are going to live, uh, the former Confederate states mostly, will not lift a finger to uh, help them transition into freedom. Now, as far as uh, Johnson is concerned, he is also going to veto another piece of legislation, and this will be overridden by the Congress. It's called the Civil Rights Act of 1866. I think it's, yeah, 1866. Anyways, uh, he passes, uh, rather, he vetoes the legislation. It shocks the Republicans, and the Republicans are now uh, looking to get a hold of him and to punish him. Johnson, now in 1867, as the U.S. Congress settles in, the new Congress settles in, and now we're transitioning into the year 1868, Andrew Johnson is clearly in the political wilderness, and he is clearly in eclipse as a politician. Uh, his uh, political enemies in the U.S. Congress are going to try to reassert their authority as, as members of Congress and as a Congress as an institution and try to uh, enforce upon Johnson and push upon Johnson their version of Reconstruction and how the government should run. So you're going to have two uh, bills that are going to, uh, to be uh, put in place. The first one is, uh, they're both designed to inflame Johnson and perhaps provoke him into some sort of action that would cause uh, an impeachment trial to get going. Uh, yes, I do believe there was uh, trappings and there were things that were, there were actions done by congressional Republicans that were trying to uh, hurt Johnson politically and to break him politically. The first one is called the Army Bill. And the Army Bill basically says that should a piece of, uh, should a, a, a presidential directive be handed down to the Army uh, or a commander in the field, uh, meaning a president using his commander-in-chief powers, then that uh, order has to go through the General-in-Chief's office. The General-in-Chief of the Army is Ulysses S. Grant. And Grant and, uh, Grant and Johnson do not like each other. It's starting to become a theme. Johnson and somebody don't like each other. And on top of that, uh, and the thinking was by the congressional Republicans that Grant, who was a Republican, maybe even a radical Republican, Grant would pull open his proverbial uh, desk drawer, look at the order, he doesn't like it, and drop it right in. 
and then not execute it. In that way, it curtails the president's commander-in-chief powers. In fact, uh, realistically, it neuters him uh, to the point where he is commander-in-chief, but only if the general-in-chief agrees, which in a sense kind of reverses uh, the relationship. Constitutionally, it's dubious of, of, uh, of the right. Th it's, it's constitutionally dubious. Anyways, the second piece of legislation that is going to be passed, and uh, by the way, Johnson vetoes both, and the Congress overrides both vetoes, uh, is the uh, what's called the Tenure of Office Act. And the Tenure of Office Act was designed to save none other than the Secretary of War and protect the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. As I've said to you before, Stanton was a, an exposed nerve ending of a human being. Uh, he and Lincoln famously uh, did not get along initially, and he, he uh, slandered Lincoln early on when they first met well before Lincoln was president. Um, yet it was also Stanton who was standing at the bedside of the slain uh, Lincoln, crying openly, saying, now he belongs to the ages. Stanton was one of the greatest secretaries of war or later defense that we've ever had. That does not make him a likable character, but he was an able administrator of the War Department during the Civil War. But Stanton, by this point in his life, had become a radical Republican, and he and Johnson did not like each other. In fact, they hated each other. Uh, there's no two, that, that word's not too strong here. Hate is the correct language. So Johnson and Stanton hate each other, and Johnson makes no secret of the fact that he had every intention of firing Secretary of War uh, Stanton. And as president, the president generally has been thought of to have the right to, uh, uh, to pick and, and have members of the cabinet as he wishes. So the Tenure of Office Act was designed to keep jo uh, Johnson from firing uh, Stanton, and it was to do it this way, that without the approval of Congress, uh, that unless the Congress approved the dismissal of the cabinet member, then the cabinet member could not be fired by the president. The legal thinking was is that the, Cong the Constitution says the president has to get a, uh, the appointment of, say, Secretary of State or Secretary of War, it has to be approved for the appointment to become Secretary of State or War, whatever the office or the cabinet level position is. That has to be done. Other, if not that, and then the thinking was by silence in the Constitution, then the president should have to get the blessing of Congress to dismiss his own cabinet members. Now, President Jackson, going back into the past, President Jackson uh, re rejected that explicitly and uh, quite vehemently and said, you will not do such a thing to me, and Jackson was strong enough to make it stand up. But Andrew Johnson was not, and so uh, that's the crux of the deal. And so Jackson, excuse me, President Johnson is going to demand the resignation or, in a sense, ask for the resignation of uh, of Secretary of War Stanton, yet uh, Stanton looks the president in his eye and says, I'm not going to give it to you. Then Johnson sends one of his cronies over to the Secretary of War's office in the War Department building there in downtown D.C., and basically they get to talking, and before it was all said and done, the crony didn't have the courage to fire uh, or at least to carry out what the president, uh, Johnson, wanted. And then Stanton promptly locks himself in his office and makes, and it's like the fourth floor of a four-story building sort of office, he locks himself in his office and makes a big dramatic scene of the whole thing. Uh, many people were moved by it, others were repelled by it, and others thought it was just silly. But Johnson is, stand, is staying in his office for two, three weeks, and may even be closer to a month, where he, he just basically says, you can't fire me and I'm not leaving. It would be akin to today if um, the Secretary of War, let's the Secretary of Defense, let's say it was uh, Mattis, had come into come to such problem, had such issues with uh, Trump, and they frankly did have issues. Uh, that Mattis locked himself into his office at the Department of Defense, and Mattis wouldn't come out. And, and frankly, what had happened at the War Department with Stanton was is that he took a basket and he let it out the window so people could feed him, and he would roll the basket up and eat, and then he'd let out his dirty clothes, and his wife would get it. Uh, his wife thought it was really silly, but uh, Stanton could be melodramatic when he wanted to. What it does, though, is it precipitates and, and touches off a constitutional crisis. Uh, crisis may be strong, but it certainly gave the radical Republicans the pretext that they needed to go off and to impeach President Johnson. And so the House of Representatives easily impeaches President Johnson, and now they, the story turns to the U.S. Senate with who is going to, whether the Senate was going to remove Johnson from office by convicting him of the high crimes and misdemeanors.
There, there was about seven, I think it was about five or six articles of impeachment. Uh, most, some of them are frankly frivolous. I think it was all frivolous uh, in my historical opinion. Uh, not a fan of Johnson, but uh, at the end of the day, he, um, he walked into a trap, but that doesn't necessarily mean he needs to be removed from office. Well, anyways, the, uh, it was all summer long, and, and it was uh, the high drama in the Senate. But when it was all said and done, the U.S. Senate fails to convict President Johnson of high crimes and misdemeanors, and Johnson survives the presidency for uh, until the end of his term, or in the end of Lincoln's term, uh, that he assumed when Lincoln was gunned down. Uh, it, it was uh, the end, however, politically for Johnson, uh, for all intents and purposes, as president. Going forward now, President Johnson is essentially a neutered uh, president. He has no authority, and nobody's paying attention to him. He can stew, and he can steam, and he can hiss and, mo and, hiss and moan. But the thing is, is Johnson's uh, career is in shambles, uh, and he's essentially done. And uh, he's kind of a, a, a pariah amongst the folk there in Washington, D.C. So Johnson has been driven from office. Or will, I say driven from office, he will leave office, but he's essentially been driven from polite society, uh, and he's done. He's, he's out. Uh, by the way, the rest of the story with uh, Andrew Johnson is this. He leaves the presidency in 1869 in a huff, uh, as you'd expect with that sort of man. And he goes back to Tennessee, and in 1878, I believe it was, he got himself elected to the United States Senate. And shortly before he died, he strolled into the U.S. Senate. That body of, uh, that, that had almost convicted him, and some of the people who were there who still hated him, he strolled in, and you could almost see that man smirking like, you didn't get quite get me yet. He's the only pr uh, former president to become a senator. And he died about a month after taking the oath of office. He died of a stroke. Uh, but Johnson was a consequential figure, but not necessarily at all a good figure in American history. So uh, with Johnson effectively sidelined as president, the, the, the scene now shifts to that of congressional reconstruction, meaning Congress is going to reconstruct the nation in the image of its own. And so uh, several things to keep in mind. And that the first thing is, is that Congress is uh, dominated by the Republican Party, especially that party, the Republicans are dominated by the radical Republicans, some of whom are starting to get a little long in the tooth. And that's foreshadowing, of course, for the end story of Reconstruction. But the thing is, is that Johnson's, oh, excuse me, the congressional Republicans have a very different, uh, similar but very different in some respects, understanding of what Reconstruction should be uh, than did President Lincoln and, of course, President Johnson. Uh, the Congressional Republicans, especially the Radicals, had said all along that the South did leave, or the states did leave the Union, and therefore, before they could come back into the Union, they had, to, and they were going to come back because they had been conquered, they had to uh, essentially be reconstructed in the image of the North. Uh, if you're familiar from the, uh, about 20 years ago, there was a series, couple of movies that probably haven't aged all that well uh, as they've gotten older and have gone into, uh, into the mothballs, uh, but Austin Powers, and one of the characters was a, uh, was a mini-me. And anyways, all that to say is, is that the idea was is that to reconstruct the South in the image of the North, turn it into uh, less agricultural and more industrial, and on and on we can go on that subject. Not only was the South uh, to be reconstructed in the image of the North and that the, the South had, had in fact left the Union and that the uh, South had to, uh, had, they were just to be treated like conquered territory as it were, not just former Americans but conquered territory. Uh, there's, uh, the thinking was basically we need to punish the South. So one of the things I ask the students uh, and I ask you, what were the motivations of the Congressional Republicans in putting together their version of Reconstruction? So number one, for your notes, the first reason for, uh, first motivating factor for uh, the Congressional Republicans was, is something you might have already kind of put in, in there, is the idea of revenge. Revenge. So, you know, it's a pretty good motivating factor. It's been motivator for man mankind probably since uh, Ugg crawled out of the primordial ooze and got into it uh, with somebody else and killed him or fought him or whatever. But revenge. Many Northerners, especially now Congressional Republicans, wanted the South to feel the war, to understand that they'd lost the war, to be punished for the war, and in essence to exact revenge for causing the war uh, between the states. So revenge was one issue right there. 
A second issue for the congressional Republicans and what was a motivating factor for them was the issue of idealism. They wanted to be, they were idealistic. Now, not every Republican in the Congress is uh, thinking high-mindedly, as I look upwards, thinking high-mindedly about, oh, what can I do to help the poor downtrodden freedmen out? In fact, a lot of Republicans probably could care less. But there were enough prominent and powerful radical Republicans in the late 1860s who could and, enfor who, and did enforce their will upon their fellow politicians. We are going to do the X, Y, and Z on behalf of the freedmen and to help them out. So anyways, uh, that's, uh, that's there. And so the idealism would be, what do we do with the freedmen? Well, we need to give them uh, civil rights. We need to give them protection. We need to help them out. Sometimes you even see, and this is uh, sometimes you get it here with a proverbial 40 acres and a mule. Uh, sometimes you'll hear the, ex, uh, the Republicans talk about uh, this is a mixture of, of revenge and idolism. Take away the land from the planter class and give it to, uh, and parcel it out and give it to the freedmen. But the idea was uh, some form of equality. Some would go so far to say is complete equality. Many would not. But certainly a helping hand, a lifting up of the freedmen as they come out of bondage and into citizenship. So idealism would be there as a motivating factor for those radical Republicans. Number three on your list, it would be simply a issue of politics. And I think that needs to be taken into account. We should not be surprised that when we find uh, politicians acting that there's politics involved. Uh, what should we uh, expect with the politics and what's going on in the politics? Uh, the thing is, is that these uh, politicians, Republicans particularly, uh, can count. And one of the problems they run into right off the bat with the, uh, with the destruction of slavery is the issue of the census and more especially the issue of the count. In politics, and especially in the House of Representatives, but in politics, uh, one of the ways you achieve representation and rough equality uh, and apportionment of districts, like in the House of Representatives, is you basically are going to say, the, Cong the Constitution says you have to reapportion these districts every 10 years on the basis of population. Well, that's fine. So prior to the Civil War, I ask you, what was the way that the census counted a slave? Now, the Southerners for years claimed that a slave was, uh, especially immediately for the decade prior to the war, that a slave was nothing more than property. But yet they would not go uh, with the answer of, well, if that's the case, then you just don't count them. So many of you know the answer, the, the counting of slaves, going back to the founding basically, uh, was a three-fifths proposition. A, uh, three uh, a slave was three-fifths of a person, and so that affects the, the uh, population of the South. Well, if you are p counting the population of the South via as a slave as a three-fifths, but once you free the slaves and you abolish slavery, what happens next? Well, if you just simply, you just sim simply think about it, it's, it's pretty obvious uh, that freedmen now counts as one. And so if you think next, what happens to uh, Southern participation in the House of Representatives, the answer becomes those Southerners uh, now gain seats. And also remember, too, in 1866 and so on, is, is that those uh, Southerners are going to gladly count the freedmen as a person and as a as a uh, you know, a citizen for the, uh, for the uh, apportionment, meaning gaining more congressional seats for the South. Yet at the same time, those Southerners are not going to give any meaningful civil rights or protections or anything of that uh, same sort to the freedmen. So the Southerners, quite frankly, uh, the leadership especially, would be glad to eat their cake and have it at the same time. And Republicans can do the math. It's not good for them. Uh, and so uh, back to something we raised in a previous lecture, but uh, many uh, Northerners or many Republicans would say, Who's winning, who won this war? It looks like we're getting the shaft, and the, the Democrats are acting like nothing had happened. The, the ex-Confederate Democrats are acting like they really kind of made out okay. So there's politics involved in the motivation of these radical Republicans. Also, to be fair, too, is that when you talk about congressional uh, actions in the Reconstruction era, uh, it's fair to remember, too, is, is that uh, when we really, you start passing legislation under congressional Reconstruction, one of the things that happens is, is that the, uh, the Republicans are going to strip the ex-Confederates of their civil rights. 
And so what I'm, when I said a few minutes ago about revenge and punitive, this could go under politics and under revenge. So these ex-Confederates will be punished, not necessarily being sent to North Dakota for punishment and uh, exile, nor obviously being stood on a wall and shot. But we are going to strip the ex-Confederates, especially the officers and supporters of the Confederacy, and really anybody who took up arms against the, uh, the United States government or materially supported the uh, Confederate States of America, they will be punished by having their civil rights stripped, particularly the right of voting. They will not be able to participate and vote in elections. So keep that in the back of your mind. So, and again, as I keep saying, those ex-Confederates, many of whom are going to be Democrats, and so the Republicans, in a sense, in the Congress have just basically uh, stacked the deck against the Democrats and stacked the deck against uh, ex-Confederates. Um, you know, I mean, I'm not sitting there crying my uh, crocodile tears for the ex-Confederates. You lost the Civil War. Uh, but it is uh, it's pretty, uh, you know, raw bone stuff. It is pretty much hardball politics. I guess you could say they're lucky not to have been sent to North Dakota or uh, into execution. But at the same time, uh, this isn't this is far more harsh than the old bygones or bygone stuff uh, that Lincoln and Johnson talked about. So anyways, uh, you have that. And the last of the four major issues that uh, motivates the congressional Republicans uh, in their battles against Johnson and battles against the ex-Confederates is uh, a basic balance of power thing. Uh, if you don't know this or you never heard this phrase before, uh, nature hates a vacuum. Nature abhors a vacuum. And as I have said, the presidency grows in power when there is a crisis, uh, whether it's a wartime or a foreign policy issue or even economics, say, thinking of Franklin Roosevelt. But the, uh, the presidency grows in power, and normally that is at the expense of somebody else. And in this case, during the Civil War, as Lincoln grew the presidency, it was at the expense of the, con the Congress. The Supreme Court is the, the th clearly the third branch in the 19th century. It's, it's not, it is co-equal theoretically, but reality was it's uh, the, the, to, like today where we sit and camp out and wait with a bated breath for the, the glorious news or the, the ruinous news from uh, the uh, mountain on high, which is the Supreme Court. Sarcasm on my part. I know the Supreme Court's literally across the street from the Capitol building. But the fact of the matter is today, the, when I kind of floated the idea in a lecture uh, about, uh, you know, who gets to interpret the Constitution, it was just absolute gospel truth that the, uh, the Supreme Court does it. 19th century wasn't quite that way. And so as uh, President Johnson now occupies the presidency, and he's a weak president, as I've said, in addition to being a bad president, you're going to see Congress start to pull back power that it had ceded to the presidency, Lincoln, during the war. So the balance of power is coming back into the more normal alignment of the 19th century. Congress ascendant, the presidency in eclipse. And really for the rest of the 19th century, even including, say, uh, President uh, Grant, and with the exception of maybe William McKinley, the uh, presidency is a much, much weaker institution than it was during or under Lincoln or President Jackson. So, in fact, but that's normally uh, the case for most of the 19th century. Most, most of the 19th century presidents are forgettable, and many of you are like saying, who are they? They're unknown. So uh, you're seeing Congress the Senate. And those are major motivations for the uh, congressional Republicans. So the congressional Republicans will strip the ex-Confederate Democrats, uh, but ex-Confederates in general, of their civil rights. Then they will sack the 10% governments. They will strip them and drive them out and say, no, no, no. You have to have first military reconstruction. Then they divide the South into multiple, I believe it was seven military districts. Uh, and the man over Texas was a guy named Philip Sheridan. And then you're going to have, after a period of military occupation, then you're going to have new Republican uh, backed, and frankly, it's going to be Republican, but new governments uh, that are going to go into effect that are dominated by Republicans. And this is Reconstruction. And, and under the, for the uh, Southerners, uh, this was a, an abomination. Republicans running the show, freedmen sitting in the Congress, sitting in the state legislature. Uh, and there was also a, accusations of uh, corruption and, and shenanigans. And there was certainly some of that. Louisiana comes to mind. But at the same time, uh, this is uh, the, uh, uh, for many, many ex-Confederate Democrats, this is an abomination. 
nation. And you're going to see them react against these Reconstruction Republican governments in the various southern states with the development of new uh, guerrilla-type outfits, militia outfits, uh, terroristic outfits. Uh, the most famous, of course, is the Ku Klux Klan. And the Ku Klux Klan is uh, prominent, particularly in Tennessee and some other uh, states uh, in the Deep South. Not as much in Texas, but you will also see rifle clubs like in Texas get going, Democratic rifle clubs. Uh, in Texas, they talked about we need to protect the frontier against the assault of the Comanche Indians and, and those sorts of things there. Never mind the Comanches were west of Waco. And the, uh, the, the one I'm referring to actually was a, a call to arms in Houston. Uh, so anyways, you've got those as an example. Um, you also say, what, Knights of the White Chameleon. Uh, anyways, all that to say is you'll have these paramilitary guerrilla outfits uh, made up of people who had served in the uh, Confederate Army or were uh, bushwhacker guerrilla types anyways during the war. Uh, may have even been so young they could not serve, but here is their opportunity to strike a blow. And so you're going to have a good deal of violence through the southern states at times, uh, whether it's in Texas or Tennessee or Mississippi or some other state. There's going to be a good deal of violence uh, that's directed toward Republicans and especially the freedmen. Uh, more than a few freedmen will be mutilated. More than a few freedmen will be uh, uh, maimed. More than a few freedmen will be hung or executed by these, uh, these roving bands of, uh, of uh, brigands and, uh, and uh, Ku Kluxers and those types, uh, the guerrillas. Uh, now, to be clear, when the... Uh, when the new president, uh, when a new president replaces President Johnson, you're going to see some uh, vigor in the U.S. government's response to protect its voters and protect the freedmen. Uh, the man who replaces uh, Andrew Johnson is Ulysses S. Grant. The Republicans had convinced Grant that he needed to run for president, that he was a uh, likely to be president, and of course Grant, who at times could play the humble man, had a, was a man of an ego, and he knew he was good because he, he was good. He was the man who beat Robert E. Lee, and uh, I would not say whipped him in the sense like uh, ran him off the field in a ba football analogy of 55 to nothing, uh, but he did uh, best Robert E. Lee. He, he uh, was the, com the Union commander who was able to, uh, to regularly uh, back Lee into a corner and finally backed him and caged him and uh, belled the cat, as it were. But anyways, uh, all of which is to say is, is that outside of Lincoln, the man who's credited with saving the Union is himself, a, um, is himself Ulysses S. Grant. So Grant runs in 1868, wins quite comfortably, frankly, in a landslide. A lot of those ex-Confederates, again, cannot vote. The Democrats are tainted by the war, so they're still hurt. Uh, all, of, all of which is on to say is, is that Grant is the man. And Grant, to his credit, will send troops, uh, more troops into the southern states at times to try to quell the rioting and the lynches and all those various and th sundry things. Um, Grant's presidency, by the way, is probably best described as checkered. I think he's a mediocre president. I think there's just so much corruption that's uh, attached to him, particularly his presidency, not him so much. But I think when you talk about Ulysses S. Grant, his presidency is a checkered presidency. It's, uh, it's got its ups and it's got its downs. But clearly, when you talk about Grant's presidency, the best moment for Grant has to be his uh, conduct with regard to uh, quelling riots and uh, quelling the vigilante violence in these southern states. And it was Grant, I think it's fair to say, that Grant was the uh, president. He was the instrument, or rather the ramrod, who broke the Ku Klux Klan in Tennessee and other places. Uh, they, they scattered them. That's not to say that all the Confederates were pacified uh, and, and quieted, but it's certainly uh, the violence that you saw erupt under the late uh, Johnson administration uh, comes to a close uh, during the, the, the Grant administration. Congressional Reconstruction is moving apace. However, though, you've got some problems, though. And uh, I've talked a lot about Reconstruction, and, and I should say this too, you probably need to be aware of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Uh, I kind of skip over them. Those are obviously big amendments. The 13th is, uh, uh, is the abolition of slavery, and the 15th deals with voting, uh, no abridgment of voting rights because of uh, color or, or slavery or what have you. Uh, but the 14th Amendment of, all, of the three, the 14th has the most legacy, and you probably ought to need to know that. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a mighty important amendment. 
But anyways, that was all passed under congressional reconstruction and congressional dominance. But there are clearly cracks by the time you get to 1870. There are clearly cracks in the Republican coalition. There are cracks in the congressional reconstruction. And some of it just has to do with attrition. Because by the time you get into the 1870s, early 1870s, 1870 even, you're seeing some of the old uh, horses in the Republican Party who uh, for years had been abolitionist or against slavery at least, uh, maybe not full-on abolitionism, uh, but they were, they were in the Congress prior to the war. Now by 1870, you find many of them uh, either leaving the Congress or dying in the Congress. Uh, you'll see, uh, before the Reconstruction ends, you'll see Thaddeus Stevens dead. You'll see Charles Sumner dead. Uh, you'll see Benjamin Wade dead. You'll see Edwin Stanton dead. Uh, on and on I can go, but you are going to see these prominent old bull Republicans, these old uh, lead horses, to use my terms. These are the sorts of men who would drive a Congress to support and to, uh, to defend Reconstruction. They're gone. And, it, and others like them, they're dying out or retiring. But what happens is, is that they're being replaced. And they're being replaced not by men who are, um, who are equally uh, dogmatic on the issue of slavery or uh, dogmatic on the issue of protecting the freedmen. You're being replaced by a lot of men who were or ambivalent, perhaps at best, on the issue of the freedmen. They may be interested in, well, let's move on with life. And sometimes students might even think, well, let's move on with a different subject. And you kind of get the idea. So by the time you get to the 1870s, that Republican, that solid Republican coalition is starting to crack. By 1872, you've got uh, another election year, 1872. Uh, you're seeing the, the, the Democrats clearly start to reconstitute themselves. Uh, one of the things to re keep in mind is that just because you're in the middle of a reconstruction, a tumultuous period, doesn't mean the political, your political enemies are going to be quiet and just uh, enervated. Early on, after the Civil War was over, clearly the Democrats had had problems. But by the time the decade ends, and certainly the beginnings of the 1870s, the Democrats are coming back together again. They're, they're papering over, they're welding over the differences the war caused. And the Democrats had never been driven into complete exile. They've never been, they had never been decimated and scattered as a, a, a remnant force in front of a, a conquering force. Uh, even the great Abraham Lincoln won in 1864, but he didn't win uh, just overwhelmingly. He won comfortably in 64, but he did not blow the Democrats out. He did not blow them out 70 to 30 or anything like that in the popular vote. Even 60 to 40 wasn't that high. So anyways, all of which is to say is the Democrats still have a role to play, and the Democrats are growing in authority. So by the time you get to 1872, something else is bothering the country, and that is the the, the scandals of the Grant administration. And as I said a minute ago, Ulysses S. Grant's administration was on the one hand uh, very good because of what they do to protect the freedmen. But on the other hand, the problem you have with L Ulysses Grant was is that he was himself a bad uh, administrator. I think very highly of Ulysses S. Grant. I think he's a very, very good man. Um, for a man who was a, a, a celebrity, he could have been a, a lot of things, and none of them good. Uh, he could have been a bloodthirsty tyrant uh, as, a, as a soldier, and he probably, had he leaned on the country, he might have been able to, because he's the hero after Lincoln dies, he could have called for and probably gotten some form of very harsh and punitive actions taken against the ex-Confederates. But I think to his credit, he did not. I think ultimately, in my opinion now, historically, I think that is one of the better uh, aspects of our nature was is that we did not go Russian or go Roman and uh, scorch the earth and salt the land with the ex-Confederates and their blood and their, blood and their ashes. Uh, I, I'm glad we didn't do that. Uh, some today might wish we had. I, I don't. But the thing is, is that uh, Grant didn't become a tyrant. Also, Grant, uh, as the great hero, could have stolen a lot of money. As you'll find in the lectures to come, the late 19th century and even mid-19th century American politics and uh, corporate practices were oftentimes, uh, you know, real slushy and naughty and, and just simply bedeviled with uh, corruption. You have the robber barons, some of whom are predominantly, uh, uh, you know, very good at what they do, and others who are just so tawdry.
Uh, Grant could have stole money left and right. He could have enriched himself because he was the great Ulysses S. Grant, and a lot of folks probably would have looked the other way. But to his credit, he did not. Grant may have been a lot of things, but he was never a corrupt man personally. However, the men around him while he was president are corrupt. Some of them are very close to him and within his family. Others take advantage of the trustworthiness of Ulysses S. Grant. And so you will find the Grant administration covered up with the, the barnacles of many money uh, issues. People trying to manipulate the currency, steal money from the treasury, uh, you know, bribes left and right because of the railroading industry, and on and on we can go. Grant himself was never implicated, and rightly so, because he wasn't. But people around him took advantage of the president, and in that falls on his head because he is the president. So Grant's, uh, his, uh, his professional monetary life is, uh, is uh, clean, but not of those people around him. But Grant's problems also extend to the fact that uh, I think just personality-wise, he, he was never good at much of anything except for being a soldier and a husband. Uh, and so he, is, he probably should never have been president. He's not a good president. Great, great soldier, great general. I, I had no issue there. But uh, uh, he's one of those individuals who had one or two things he was great at and everything else should never have been, uh, should never have been let near power. And in the case of Grant uh, being a soldier or being a general and being a husband or a father too, uh, those, were to his, uh, th those were the stars in his crown. And the last thing I would say he could have taken advantage of, but to his credit, he did not, was is that as a celebrity, you and I both know there are people who would like to sleep with celebrities. And I mean that that's kind of crude on my part, kind of uh, just kind of earthy and tawdry and just kind of slimy on my part to say it that way. But we got to be honest, too, in history a little bit. You know as well as I do, there are men and women who would love to be able to say, I uh, slept with uh, President so-and-so. I slept with this uh, movie star. I slept with a sports athlete, whatever. Uh, because it's, it's, you know, the, it's just because you could say you did it. And, you know, maybe today we're more forward about it than they were in the past. But at the same time, President Grant, had he wanted to, had, excuse me, said it better, General Grant, had he wanted to, General Grant could have uh, taken up mistresses left and right because he was General Grant. And to his credit, he did not. He, was, he had one woman in his life. There was only one woman in his life as far as uh, outside of his mama sort of thing. That was his wife, Julia Dent. Julia Dent was his love. And, and when Grant was not around her, oh, he was in trouble. He was uh, like a, a, you know, unless he had the army to take up his time and more particularly to keep him occupied and keep him busy, if Julia was not around him, he was uh, bored. He was pr prone to getting drunk. He, could, he was not an alcoholic, but when Grant did, when Grant got uh, bored, uh, that's when the bottle came out, and frankly, he'd go on a couple-of-day bender sort of thing. Uh, but Grant, uh, he, loved, he loved Julia. And the problem Julia had was is that, and, and this is to be really shallow on my part, I mean, very, I probably even shouldn't say it, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I've already gone here. But Julia, uh, she was, she was cr horribly cross-eyed. If you ever look at pictures of Julia Dent Grant, she, you never see her looking, nor rarely you re see her looking straight on at the camera. Uh, you know, they would do it, she'd be turned her head like this or that. If the camera's straight ahead like it is where I'm recording, uh, it would be off to the side. And the reason being is that she did not want that horrible cross eye to get show up. Um, yet Ulysses S. Grant loved her. And uh, despite those, uh, again, this is admittedly very shallow to say on my part, but he loved that woman. And he, that was the only love of his life. He was a good father. Everybody said that. He was a good husband. Everybody said that. Oh, by the way, not only uh, another foible, I guess you could say, is Grant smoked like a chimney. Uh, he smoked cigars inveterately. Uh, in fact, in during the war, he'd smoke between 10 and 20 a day. And I'm not talking about little old sar small cigars. I'm talking about those big things. But he smoked cigars all the time, even after the war was over. So he smoked like a chimney. Uh, but Grant's uh, presidency starts to wear thin. Even the great Ulysses S. Grant, his celebrity, can't insulate him from the problems of his, uh, uh, of his administration, of the, the, the faults of his administration, of all that, those money issues that are attached to it. 
And so by 1872, Ulysses S. Grant's He's going to run for re-election. And by the way, Grant's not a wealthy man. I should, if I haven't said that before to you, you need to remember that. He's not a wealthy man. So in a sense, Ulysses S. Grant living in the White House, he needed a place to live. I, I say that kind of flippantly, but I'm also being half serious too. Uh, but Grant, uh, anyways, in 72, he runs for re-election and Grant wins uh, with comfort. It wasn't, uh, no, it wasn't as big of a nut margin as what he had before. But one of the things that the Republicans in 1872 had to do to kind of placate the Democrats was, and to keep the country from perhaps trying to break up again over this time more political issues rather than just uh, uh, the moral issue or the polit moral political issue of slavery, is, is that the Democrats are starting to scream, you have to, you have to give the civil rights back to the ex-Confederates. You have to give civil rights back to the ex to our Democrats. You can't disfranchise the, uh, our political supporters forever. They are citizens as well, and so that ha that has to come home. And in 1873, well, put this in your notes. 1872, it is called the Amnesty Act. The Amnesty Act of 1872. Uh, gives the voting rights and civil rights back to the ex-Confederates, but it doesn't go into effect until 1873. So that helps Grant get reelected. So Grant is reelected. But in 1873, these ex-Confederates are starting to be able to vote once more, and uh, they're, they're starting to get back into uh, line, and they can start voting in state and local elections, which means down south, those ex-Confederates now can start to vote against the Republicans and turn them out. And there's going to be a lot of voting and a lot of violence in these southern states as these uh, ex-Confederates come back into the voting booth and come back in and with a vengeance to take back the power that they think had been taken away from them. Uh, ultimately, the Recon ultimately, Reconstruction, at least on a national scale, ends in 1876 with the election of Rutherford B. Hayes. In 1876, Rutherford B. Hayes uh, was, this is something you better go ahead and remember, Rutherford B. Hayes is going to be a, one of many union officers running for president. Uh, presidential fever infected much of the union officer corps after the war was over. Some famously were opposed to it. William Tecumseh Sherman is an example. But others succumbed quite readily to Potomac or White House fever. Uh, Grant, we've just discussed, being the great general, General Hayes, General Rutherford B. Hayes, not only was he a, an officer in the Civil War, but also he was from Ohio. You need to write that down. Ohio has been the birthplace of many a Republican presidential candidate, and more particularly a Republican nominee, and has been the birthplace of many a president. Uh, it was said uh, by some waggish individual, and I'd have to go back and look up the details, but it goes like this. Uh, some are born to greatness, others achieve it, others still just come from Ohio, meaning those who go to the presidency. Others just come from Ohio. Rutherford B. Hayes was a general in the war. He was not uh, distinguished, uh, nothing like uh, uh, Grant or, any, or Sherman, but at the same time, he did fight, he did serve. He comes from Ohio, so you check off a couple of good boxes right there because the question is, what did you do during the war? But to give you an idea how fast the, Repu the Democrats are coming back, the Democrats had won control of the House of Representatives in 1874. They had been seemingly in the wilderness, at least in the Congress, in 1866 and 8, but now by 74, they're back. The, the Democrats are back in the control of the House of Representatives, and who knows, maybe they'll get the Senate again in very short order. The thing is, is that the Democrats are certainly are able to get over their political differences because of the war by the early to mid-1870s, and they are coming back together rapidly. They run a guy named Samuel J. Tilden. He probably literally probably won the uh, election, not just in the popular vote, but also in the Electoral College. But there are some Republican shenanigans in Louisiana and South Carolina, meaning sh Electoral College shenanigans of di uh, divided votes and so forth. And when it's all said and done, the Republicans said, we will give uh, you, you, the Democrats, an end to Reconstruction in exchange for President Hayes. You've got to give us President Hayes, and we'll end Reconstruction. And the Democrats, especially Southern Democrats, said, deal. And so there uh, ends Reconstruction, because uh, when, when Hayes is elected and confirmed as the president in 1876, truthfully the year 1877, the Reconstruction formally ends down south. It was ending, but it's completely gone now. And so 
the thing is, what happens next? Well, the North or the Union or the U.S. government said more properly now starts to pull out of the issue, pull out of the uh, of the South and just let them be. Let them be. And there were lots and lots of Northerners, let alone Southerners, but lots and lots of Northerners by 1876 who were ready to let the, uh, the war be gone. Let the country move on. It's been 20 years that we've dealt with the issue of war and po uh, possible war and disunion. 25 years, 30 years. Let's move on. So I guess the thing is at the end of the day, and, and this, uh, at the time of this recording, this issue pops up in the form of, uh, you know, what happened after the Civil War is over, what should we have done? I've, I've read a lot of it in this, uh, the last few months as I'm sitting here recording this on, on September 10th, 2020. So I've seen a lot of these sorts of things. So what should we have done? Could they have done more? I don't know. I don't really don't think so. I think you probably got as much reconstruction as you were going to get. So here's the three reasons why. I think it was about as good as it was going to be. So number one, why did Reconstruction only go so far as it could? One, politics. I've already just more or less said the answer just a second ago when I said that the Democrats had reunified regardless of the war or what had happened in the war, and their common enemy, the Republicans, their common uh, goal, regained the presidency and power. They're coming together to achieve that. So politically... Uh, the Republicans were never, as I said a few minutes ago, they never were strong enough, the Republicans were never strong enough to sweep the Democrats completely off the field and scatter them into the four winds of heaven. The Democrats held, a, held on and, and waited for their opportunity, and it took a while, but they came back. So that's one. So the politically, uh, there was never going to be the support for a full-on, complete restoration of the South in a political sense because the Democrats were not going to allow that. And they were too powerful, uh, especially by the 1870s, to, uh, for the Republicans to just enforce their will. So the Democrats weren't going to allow any sort of sweeping, completely off-the-charts radical reconstruction of the South. I mean, sow the earth sort of stuff. Secondly, economics. Here's the second reason why the South was uh, never completely reconstructed as perhaps some in the North wished to do. The thing is, is that for all the talk uh, in, in, of the war, uh, the planter class was not destroyed by the war. You, uh, you couldn't do it. You just simply couldn't do it. Um, as I've said before to you, when you talk about what are you going to do with the ex-Confederates right at the end of the war, and some have said over the years, and I've kind of threw it out to you perhaps, of why don't we uh, take the land away from the planter class and give it to the yeoman farmer or give it to the freedman? Well, you've got what are called those bill of attainder restrictions in the Constitution, and it's simply the Constitution says you can't take people's land to, as a punishment, and that's what a bill of attainder is. You take people's property away and just as a punishment for whatever. They're illegal under the Constitution, so the courts were not going to back that up. Uh, and so these, uh, the economics uh, of the South was changed, to be sure, but in a sense it was still the same, that many of the same families, even if the patriarchs were dead, at, in some cases just by attrition or by the war, uh, the, the same dominant families in these southern states were still in power in the late 19th century, and they still ran the show, as it were. And anyways, all that to say is, is that they were... Um, um, they, they control the shots. And so, uh, in a sense, some things do change in the South, but in some respects, they didn't change at all. And without uh, just uh, taking their land away and violating the Constitution all over the place, you can't do it. Um, number three, number three is militarily. Uh, at the end of the Civil War, the, probably the best way you could have achieved the destruction of the old regime in the South in totality and uh, rebuilt the South in the way you wanted to probably would have depended upon uh, one Lincoln living. And secondly, and this one is this is one I don't think they could have overcome, I don't think Lincoln could have overcome it, is, is that when the war was over, and say in 1865, when the war's over, the country, meaning the Northerners, the Union, wanted the boys home. I mean, you had, at the end of the Civil War, over one million men under arms in the North. And by the time you get to about 1866, mid-66, it's down to like 100,000, uh, 75,000. What I'm trying to say to you, and this is not unusual in American history, our practice has been as Americans, when the war is over, bring the boys home. Whether that's the First World War or the Second World War, there was always this uh, great groundswell of bring the boys home. 
politically, there was no way on God's green earth, uh, excuse me to say it that way, but there was, and I apologize, uh, but uh, there was no way that uh, Johnson, let alone his, uh, his opinions and thoughts, there was no way that the North, Republican or Democrat, was going to say, leave the army in toto down south so they can patrol Georgia, they can patrol Mississippi, they control uh, Texas, and make those Southerners bow down uh, to the North and make those Southerners bend their knee uh, to the new ways. Uh, they, the Northerners wanted the boys home. The people wanted the boys home. Mothers wanted their sons home. Wives wanted their husbands home. And all I can go, children wanted their daddies home. And so they're going to come home. You saw this after World War II. There was a great groundswell, bring the boys home. And it took, uh, and, and you couldn't stop that. I mean, if we are to some degree or another a democratic small d, but a nation of democracy and votes, uh, the people are going to vote to bring the boys home after such a tumultuous war with such, uh, some cases, uh, such hardship. They want their kids and their family home. And it's going to happen. So what happens is that the, uh, you know, those uh, lynchings and those uh, marauders that I talked about, uh, they were allowed to metastasize. And in order to enforce a new way and a new will upon the South, especially at the outset of the war, you had to leave an occupying army in the South. There was just no political will to do it. So maybe, you know, we can all say this should have happened and that should have happened and that's fine, but reality in the, in the uh, United States after the Civil War was over it may just have been that we got as much out of, the, out of Reconstruction as we possibly could have. The nation decides it's going to start uh, bringing itself together, a unity theme. Uh, we'll talk more about that perhaps later. But Reconstruction's over, and it's time to move on, as it were. So maybe I'll say to, sum it up like this. Some people have said, who won the Civil War? Well, the North did. It abolished slavery and saved the Union. But who won Reconstruction? You maybe arguably the South did, and I think there are days I would say that, uh, because for the next 75, 100 years or so, at least until the civil rights era in the 1950s and 60s, the South was largely left alone to handle its uh, issues by itself, for good and for bad, and uh, depends on who you're talking about and where the situation is. Probably depends on uh, gives you the answer you're thinking of there. So that's a good place to stop, and uh, we'll pick up and run with the New South in the next lecture. Thank you.